podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And what we're going to be, it's a really interesting topic, this one, Bob, I love it. And you can tell it's one of your titles. Is therapy like chess? Absolutely. But they're nearly, they're all my titles, Jackie. They are, but this one in particular, because I know how much you love chess. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome, welcome. Um, I've just come back from a sort of personal, professional growth week um, in Spain, where it was 25 degrees, so or 24 degrees. So um, it's good to be back. Good to have you back. I like this podcast. Yes, you're quite right. I do play chess, so it appeals to me. And when I <clears throat> when I think of psychotherapy, I always remember a client of mine some years ago now who was a professional chess player. And uh, he said, oh, psychotherapy is just like chess, Bob. I always remember him saying that. We talked a lot about it. So I thought about it, really. I thought we'd make a good title for a podcast. Yeah. What do you think about it? Most therapists who are trained uh, in the art of psychotherapy um, are probably trained what is called different treatment plans yes yeah in other words you would have been the same wouldn't you yeah. in your training you would have learned about contracts and you would have learned about working with clients and you also learned about different treatment plans in other words, and in other words maps for different types of clients yeah so one of the books which we haven't talked about, I realise, in one of the podcasts is called Personality Adaptations by Ian Stewart and Van Joins, which talks about six different... Oh, you've got it, Jackie, have you? Oh, I can see you can swing it back. There <laughs> we are. Very big book. It's great for Tai Chi or putting your head on and to rest. <laughs> anyway, it's a very thick textbook. But it talks about six different adaptations or personalities and um, different ways of reaching people and pitfalls to not go down for each different adaptation or character profile. So a lot of psychotherapists in their training will have learned treatment plans yes. or maps, if you like, to follow, or at least sequences of a psychotherapy process. So, for example, one of the classic ones would be for a lot of a lot of uh, therapists, I think, first step will be called creating a working alliance. Yeah. And then from that, in TA, it would be things like looking at uh, the personality model framework, parent, adult, child, how much energy people um, play in different parts of themselves and the problems that causes, especially if they're not in their adult ego state. And then from that, perhaps looking at developmental deficits in the child ego state and helping them heal those and develop different coping strategies or decisions to integrate in the here and now. And that's a sort of treatment plan, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think we all need a plan going forward. Otherwise, oh, but... we're just meandering around. <laughs> yeah, so, and then, of course, different books talk about different treatment plans for different... Um, adaptations or different personalities, such as that book we've just talked about, yeah. personal adaptations by Institute and Van Joins. Um, and I think for the beginning therapists particularly, treatment plans often are a structure to hold on to. Yes, they definitely were for me. I still quite like a structure. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah. So am I safe to say probably that you would think of... Uh, the first phase of psychotherapy may be including, you know, creating a working alliance where there's trust, yeah. safety, security, and in that perhaps contract making. Absolutely. That needs to be the first stage, yeah. Which is why I suppose in my contract that I said I, I asked them to come for a minimum of four weeks to kind of 
you know, agree to come for four weeks? Because I think it takes at least that amount of time to just get to know each other a bit. Yeah. And in that contracting stage or getting to know each other stage, I suspect, given you're trained as a TA therapist, you might be looking at things like script analysis or looking at such things as different uh, ways to contact a person. Yeah. Which is, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. So yeah. in your head, Jackie, you probably have, and I may be incorrect completely in this, um, a sort of vague, if not specific, way of thinking of phases of a psychotherapy treatment. Yeah, it's always open to adapting for me. But yes, yeah. I think most psychotherapists would. Yeah. Well, I don't think this is sort of like new information. No. Uh, and in TA, there's many different types of treatment plan, but they all start with building a working alliance, which has got an element of trusty, you know, safety and security in it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And in that time, you'd also build up a sort of, you know, whole wealth of what is called script analysis looking at the life plan, which has been adapted often in um, the client's unconscious processes. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I suspect that everybody listening to this would probably have a starting point on how they contact the clients in front of them and where that may or may not go. Yeah. So linking this into chess, are you thinking that that's kind of like the opening moves on the chess? Oh, Jack, this is why I love doing podcasts with you. <laughs> you're, you're reading my mind. Yeah, if you go and play chess, chess is like three games three games in one. So the first stage of, you know, a chess game is done very quickly, by the way. Uh, and there are a whole number of what we call opening moves, yeah, which you might play, and then the other person responds to those opening moves with well rehearsed other moves to yeah. that particular move. So usually when people play their opening games or opening moves, sorry, sorry, not games, opening moves, they might move in the first seven or eight moves uh, and then the person responds back very, very, very quickly because yeah. each person knows the predictable sequence of that particular opening move. So for example, there's a particular move called the Sicilian defense. The Sicilian defense in, in chess. And so you will make the first six, seven moves as quick as a flash. And the other person who knows the Sicilian defense, because I've read up on it, will reply. So those opening moves take place pretty quickly. Um, and the people responding, not are they predictably responding in a certain way, but they may have a variation of that defense, which yeah. in a way is um, helping the person understand a, th a bit about the variations that a person might move in the opening sessions. So, th so that's what I'm saying. I'm linking it a little bit to chess, the therapy sequences right at the beginning. Yeah. Like a it therapy. makes sense. Like you say, you know, the, once you've got through that, the, the way that we interact with each other and that, you know, alliance going, then for me, it is personality types and driver behaviours and, and things like that that I fall back on all the time in my opening moves just to give me an insight and some confidence on where we're going to go with it and how potentially that they're going to respond to it. Yeah. The defences that they might have around therapy, yeah. I think... A bit of difference is that people playing chess will rapidly move their opening moves because they've crammed up on it or they yes. know different yeah. variations. So they move pretty quickly. Where in psychotherapy, it's more slower. It's much less predictable in a way. There's a lot more going on perhaps in those opening sessions than there is in chess because everybody knows the different openings and the different response to the openings. Yeah. But in chess, they then lead to what is called the middle game, where much more creativity will happen. 
So you have your opening moves, that, lose, that leads to the middle game. And in the middle game of chess, there's a lot of creativity. And according to the unique style of the person in front of you, then the person on the other side will respond in a certain way. Yeah. Now, if we think of psychotherapy, um, once we've built up a working alliance and all the trust and safety and security has been put in, and we have start learning about a person's coping mechanisms or their developmental deficits, um, we will probably head a certain way. Now, what makes therapy, I think, particularly different from chess, but of course, the unpredictability of chess in the middle game is pretty similar, but um, is the unpredictability of the client in front of you. Oh. So in other words, as you get to know the person, the unique of the person in front of you the client i'm talking about here yes yeah and their history and how they've become the way they are the unique person that tells their story to you um maybe different themes or different decisions um for many of the clients who perhaps have, have developed a similar story but of course has has a completely unique process to it. Yes, yeah. So as you get to know the person, even though you've done the script analysis, you'll be attuned and going with um, helping the, or be a witness to the client's story. So a lot happens then. So if yes. we, talk, we talk about phases and sequences of a psychotherapy treatment plan, First phase is always going to be working alliance, getting to know the, the actual client. The second stage, uh, which is really much more about helping the person not only develop their early story, but learning the coping mechanisms that help the person survive, but also doesn't help them today. Oh. Yeah. I think like it, you said, you know, the the themes might be the same, you know, with lots of different people but the way that they got to it and the content of those themes is unique to all of us hmm. so you will t tailor the psychotherapy process to that particular unique story yeah that they are telling you yeah is how i see that second or third stage if you like um uh, and then you will go towards helping the person heal their developmental deficits and help them look at how the past may play out in the present unless they start making new degree decisions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because it is quite it, 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 quite a complex. It is very complex. That That middle game, if you want to call it that, if we're relating it to chess. Mm. Mm. a lot happens absolutely and even you know even though the 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 person's background and their upbringing and everything is is constant and it stays the same our state of mind changes from moment to moment so every time the client comes in we're seeing a different side of them a lot of the time mm. well that's what i find you know sometimes they come in and they're they're in a you know a good state of mind and the world is not that bad and then the next time they come you know, something's happened or, you know, their state of mind has shifted and every, they're, they're really negative and everything's really bad. So we're, we're constantly adapting to what's in front of us, although we've got this undercurrent of a plan. Mm, that's, right. that's how I find it, yeah. And I think people have been TA trained. Um, according to, you know, which I think school you come from in TA, um, Eric Byrne, who was the originator of TA in the late 1950s, early 1960s, he had his, his, his major thrust, if you like, of cure, um, developing, helping the client develop a resilient, robust adult ego state. Yeah. So when the client is coming from an adult ego state in, in TA language, they're acting appropriately to the age they are. So I'm 73, so acting, thinking, feeling, and behaving according to my own age. Yes. And not for, not for some regressed younger self or from some sort of 
uh, you know, uh, moral duty or shoulds and oughts of uh, a mother and father or significant other. So uh, Byrne was very much a person who used transaction analysis or developed transaction analysis um, with, an, uh, with the idea primarily of helping the person strengthen their adult ego state, which is very CBT-ish, actually. Yes, yeah. It it does make sense. So I recently had somebody contact me and ask if I would see um, a member of their family, a young member of their family that was severely autistic, mm. which one I didn't feel qualified enough to do, but also I felt like potentially they wouldn't have enough adult capacity to undergo psychotherapy. So... What was the criteria behind that decision? I understand what you've just said, but I mean, what brought you to that conclusion? Because I think with autism, one of the major things is, you know, transactions between people and communication and that sort of stuff. And I, I know that I would find that difficult in a, a therapy session to get their understanding across without the communication, the, the skills that you need to, in order to do that, body language and, and all that sort of stuff, for me personally. Yeah, so you're making decisions all the, all, all the way along um, who's suitable for psychotherapy and who might not be. For, for example, somebody who's got active um, psychosis and doesn't have much access to their here and now adult. Yeah you could argue may not be suitable for modern day psychotherapy where, uh, or the sort of psychotherapy we practice, which is helping the person deal with their own developmental deficits, which would mean the person um, accessing their younger self or unconscious process. Yeah. And for somebody who sort of coming from a psychotic place, that's pretty uh, unprotective. Yeah, not well, actually. Yeah, yeah, and you know, with with people that are autistic, that you know, being able to communicate that with somebody else, I would imagine is quite difficult. And I just don't feel, you know, competent in that area in order to do it. So decline. Well, yeah. well put it, I think that's professional because it means that you are both very, being very transparent and saying, well, perhaps I've got the professional expert tease or whatever way you look at it yeah to do the work that you want to do yeah absolutely but that that middle game i think is is when we do start to do you know the most beneficial work oh once they started to trust you which is the first phase yeah started to develop their own story and feel trustful with you to tell them that story which is why they're there in the first place yeah uh, and it is the foundations of any psychotherapy treatment plan or any psychotherapy process because without those foundations psychotherapy isn't likely to happen yeah so that first stage of psychotherapy is very very important and then leads on to um that process in the middle which is more especially if you're in ta there might not be other disciplines listening um and of course if eric burns the originator of ta was listening would disagree with me because his type of ta was different from the way i think uh i mean it's not that i don't think about the adult eager state of resilience but i'm much more interested in looking at the developmental deficits of the past yeah. and how the past affects the present and what the client or myself and the client needs to do which is usually the second stage as far as i'm concerned um which is heal the developmental deficits so they can develop different coping strategies so they can have a different enhanced way of life and that would lead on to the third stage of course which is helping the client integrate those new coping mechanisms and helping them transition into a more healthy 
uh, script, if you like. Yes. Yeah. And then after that comes endings. Yeah, because the integration part is it, it obviously it's really important, but it that's kind of like a relearning of things and trying new ways of being. It's it's like experimental. It's experimental to a stage. Yeah, you're correct. No, you're correct, Jackie. It's it's new ways of being for the client. So it is by definition experiential. I was thinking though, if you've done a lot of the healing and developmental work with their relational needs or their child ego state, and they've decided and putting new ways of being on the road, then as much as they can, they will have developed new or newish coping mechanisms, which are experiential, so I agree with you, Jackie. However, I'm, I'm just thinking, I had a client earlier on today and we were talking about boundaries. Ah. And, you, you know, they found it really difficult to put boundaries in place or to uphold any boundaries that they did have. So if I use that as an example, when I'm saying experiential, it's about them, you know, putting boundaries in place and then potentially coming back and talking about how it was to put the boundary in place, whether it worked, whether they upheld it and how it felt. So that's what I mean by experiential is practicing and integrating what they're learning in the therapy room out in the big wide world. Oh, yes. I mean, I 100% agree with you. And I was going to say that the pre regrexit which is really important, is that the client has you on their side. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very different, usually from their toxic history, where they were alone or neglected or felt um, depressed, stressed, or whatever way you want to look at it. Usually they don't have someone to help them do what you've just talked about. Yeah. So that's it by definition is new and experiential. Yeah, because I think we can all put things in place, you know, on paper and think, yeah, that works really. I can understand that. But then putting it in practice and maintaining it is the, the difficult part. That's right. And one of the real important things for the client to undertake which you are talking about here to lead to the part we're talking about is that they def defeat or desensitize the toxic other which has been part of their very challenging history yeah and through what we we'll call transference if you like for, or osmosis if you want to use another word um take you on as the protector and new champion same in chess yeah the end game end game is when you defeat you defeat and you encircle and trap the significant other or the king if you like uh which leads to a checkmate what a wonderful way of looking at it. <laughs> it's interesting though, isn't it? Absolutely. That's what we're doing in therapy, we're helping the person defeat, desensitize, yeah. make uh, the other powerless. So the client, in this sense, be can become a bigger and take ownership of their own space so they don't feel so vulnerable anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And all this is internal, obviously. It's not like, you know, maybe it is confronting somebody in the life, but not necessarily. Well, it's internally, but I know you don't use this technique, but I like these techniques. It's internal, yes. But I think to get to the internal world, I like the technique of two chair techniques. Yeah. Three chair techniques to enable the person to actually, in fantasy, stand up to the very people they weren't able to stand up to yeah and then feel a you know a sense of empowerment and powerfulness which then enables them to make new decisions yeah and, and that to, is a safe space to do it with you championing them and you 
you know, when I've seen it witnessed in my training, I think the, the trainer actually had their hand on the back of the, you know, the, the person that was the client as if to say, I'm here, I'm behind you and I've got your back kind of thing. It was a real, uh, a real metaphor. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, there's many comparisons to the sequences of psychotherapy and the sequences of chess. But one of them, I think, is what I'm just talking about here, which is so important, which is the defeat of the toxic significant other, which has been so challenging yeah. for the client's developmental in a, in a healthy way. Yeah. And it's nice to look at therapy as having a beginning, a middle and an end to it as well. Absolutely. And I like what you talked about in terms of boundaries. So they start to see where they begin and where they ended. Yeah. And where they can begin again and how they can take ownership of themselves in a healthy way. Yeah. I think there are phases of psychotherapy, just like there are phases of chess. Now, what's really important, though, in psychotherapy, which is very different from chess, is our empathy and attunement as the sort of methods to get to a developmental perspective, which you wouldn't have in chess. I'm no. sure we can find some metaphors and parallels and different things like that, uh, if I wanted to enough. But I think the methods of a in-depth relational psychotherapy, uh, attunement, involvement, inquiry, are very important tools that are different from chess. We might be psyching out the other person or attempting to get, thinking about what the other person's thinking and all those sorts of things. But I don't think true attunement happens. No. In chess, I mean. No, no. But therapy, I think it's really important to, you know, use the tools of attunement and empathy to enable the person to or enable the therapist and the client um, to develop the journey that they're actually uh, involved in. Yeah. I like the way you said then about, you know, inquiry as well. I think that's a massive part of, you know, <laughs> checking in with them to make sure that I've got the right end of the stick. Mm -hmm. And calling a client out as well. I seem to be doing that a lot lately <laughs> what do you mean by that so i understand I, I sometimes think that a client is doing or saying what they think i want them to they're adapting to you yes yeah so i, I see I, what you like a book then personally adaptations yes yeah so i i will call them out on that you know so, in, so in an inquiring way you know, is that so, really what you think <laughs> so what you mean it's the psychoanalytical term of confrontation when you talk about calling out. Yes. Uh, confrontation from a, a positive. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. 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 So it's a psychoanalytical. So when you say calling out, you mean confrontation in a positive frame. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you also, you said you're doing more of that recently. Yeah. Yes, I think so. With one particular client who I've kind of got the makings of him now, if that makes sense. And when you I understand him more? say again, do you mean uh, you understand him more? Yes. And yeah. by understanding him more, you're not able to, you're more able to perhaps think about confrontation in terms of helping him um, understand as well. Yes. I think that on the times when I have confronted him in a, a very, you know, kind way, he's had a real breakthrough and actually realised that what he was saying wasn't actually what he was doing or what he was feeling. It was, yeah, a protective mechanism. Well, I think that's what uh, psychotherapy is all about. I don't think it's all about empathy and nurture. No. I think some people want that, but, you know, for, for this particular one... But I think that's only because I have got so attuned to this client. Yes, and he must obviously, or both of you, must have a template of trust for that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
it's a really interesting topic. I love I love the kind of the the idea of the opening game, the middle game, and the end game. I I do like that. Yeah. Good, great. I enjoyed talking about two of my favourite passions, um, chess and psychotherapy. But of course, psychotherapy is my major passion. But I do enjoy talking about uh, the two passions of mine. I enjoyed it, Bob. Thank you. And what we're going to be talking about next time is when intimacy and closeness can be unsafe in the therapy room. Yeah, and that's a big subject. Yes. Until next time, Bob. Thank you. Goodbye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.